All right, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, DJ. So, um, do we have a little sound? Amigo, how does it sound and look so far? Um, Sunny, Buzz, good. Glad to hear that. Uh, Amigo, did you get the picture of, of my setup tonight? <laughs> <clears throat> it's pretty crazy, right? Um, wonder if I can. Uh, hey, cats! I need to talk to you because I'm going to do something locally, and I want you in on it. So when you when you're feeling like it, we should talk. So let me. I'm going to try something else because I'm pushing pushing all the pushing all the buttons today. Let's see what happens here. Yeah. Oh, well, boo hiss. Can't get to that because I'm in mass storage mode. All right. I'm charging my phone, so. Good evening. Yeah, cat. So, um, I'm going to do a show, uh, a presentation, you know, on DNC, the political fall and all that. And I don't know whether I'm going to do it in Burnsville or spruce pine yet but I could use some help um, kind of coordinating that so we should talk some um, you know you could help promo and all that stuff <laughs> hey amigo no honestly it's like it's a totally cobbled together kind of situation so um, you know I just thought you could appreciate it uh, I threw it all together this afternoon um, I don't know how many viewers we have yet because, um, I'm not, can somebody give me a viewer count once we get over 10, I'll probably go ahead and start. Um, got to call Dell, my speakers are messed up. Oh, well, oh, 14. Hey, excellent. So we'll go ahead and start. Is somebody tweeting it out and letting the other rooms know? Um, so welcome OPN. I'm doing this on XSplit tonight, so that's why I can't see the uh, the count. And um, excellent cats. I'll be in touch. Rest your eyes. It's not. I think I'm looking at October 1st. Um. So tonight we're going to do a couple of little things. Um. And if you have any trouble with the video or audio, if you'll let me know, I am watching the chat stream. Um. And I'll try to adjust it on the fly. And um, I'm in a different different room tonight um, because I needed more space to spread out. Spread out. So what we're going to do tonight is uh, a DNC debrief. I'm going to pontificate a little bit about you know, my observations and my feelings about the experience and you know some of the positive and negatives and lessons that I learned. Um, thank you, thank you, OWNN, Northern and that crew for being so supportive and, uh, you know, taking time out of your day to put us up. So we're going to do the observations. I'm going to just give a brief rundown of the week. Um, I want to editorialize a little bit because I've been reading and thinking a lot since I got home. Um, if I cough a little bit, it's because I got the Occupleg while I was there. Um, I survived until I got home and then I had time to be sick and all that. So I want to give shouts out to some people. Um, thank you, OPM production team. Thank you especially to Zena for helping me test this rig out tonight. Because tonight, ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, we are going to do the first ever, as far as I know, um, live call-in show on a live stream channel that's just run by regular people. This is not HuffPost here. But I think we figured out a rig where we can do live phone call-in. So when we get to a place where I want to do Q&A, um, we'll give that a whirl. So this is kind of like a beta test. So you guys are here with history being made. And if this works pretty good tonight, uh, we'll probably do more of that. Um, but it's taking a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of testing. A whole lot of wires and more than a little bit 
of patience and and I want to thank uh, <laughs> DJ check it I'm working on live call in I have my cell phone patched through my computer so anybody that can make a call uh, nationally or internationally I guess to a regular cell phone number is going to be able to call and it, it's pretty slick um, you know <laughs> Zena, Zena and I tested she was such a sweetie because I'm re I'm don't, I don't feel great so I have zero patience and the, the lag was um, killing us and I was wanting what's it doing what's it doing blah 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 you know so she was you, you guys can credit her for for this happening tonight um, also, I don't know where Suze is, but she gets the, the credit for the original idea way back when. You know, she said, we should do a call-in show, and so I'm just now getting around to it. So, Peaceful Movement, welcome. So, I'm going to launch right in because, you know, I am prone to um, to ramble. If you guys, um, if I'm going on too long or you're getting bored, just tell me. I have plenty of topics to cover tonight. First of all, uh, DNC Week. I want to give a shout out to the OPEM production team. Uh, everybody was working their ass off. And DJ VJ, uh, she was working with us. And bless her heart, you know, it was she was juggling a lot. Time differences and everything, but she was a good sport and a good humor and helped us out and was very supportive and encouraging. Um, really appreciate the uh, the pitch in there and hope we hope you didn't pull all your hair out. You have such lovely hair. Um, but I know we were making you crazy. I can say without any question that the um, there's a huge difference of working on the ground like we were versus working in the studio like we, we normally do. The uh, amount of control on the ground is, for the most part, non non-existent, just non-existent. So everything's spontaneous. There's not a lot of organization. If you try to be organized, it just goes awry. Um, so we we fumbled a lot, but we tried to get some good content and everything up. And it couldn't have been possible without everybody pitching in. It's uh, long and grueling days. Um, I have mad respect for the streamers that do this day in and day out. Um, I don't know if they're watching, but it, I love to get a shout out to Organizer X, Occupy I, Stop Motion Solo, my streaming buddies there on the ground. Um, I learned so much working with those guys, not only about um, just how to manage hardware, but just anticipation, kind of reading the vibe of the crowd, where to look, where to think, how to engage with people. Um, the the streaming during a march is is really a skill that I don't think I have um, anywhere near the chops that they do. Uh, definitely uh, Occupy Eye sets the standard. He, he and Stop Motion, they've done it so much. Organizer X is great. He's a he's a participant. Uh, in the marches too he is not just filming he is participating he's chanting he's trying to stir the crowd up um, I found you know my best effort was working on the periphery or going into uh, into the crowd and getting some interviews I got um, a, a, a good many good interviews I really like them I'm gonna put them together you know in a compilation um, so that was a good experience um, learned a lot from those guys. Also, I want to be sure to uh, give a shout out to Jenna Pope and Tracy Williams. Both of those young women are fantastic photographers and tireless workers. Um, we ended up, um, you know, we had this loft place to stay that a donor gave us, which was really awesome. Pretty close to downtown, but the downtown area was so locked down there was a lot of a lot of walking a lot of transportation issues it's not um not at all like a major metro area where there's um you know good ground transportation so between x and i we had the two cars so we would shuttle we had drop off points so we were organ you know just kind of organizing that and doing logistics um we um 
hooked up with Jenna early Saturday morning, like at 2.30 in the morning at the park. Um, and uh, Occupy Eye called and said, hey, you know, there's this person you need to meet. And it would be great if she could kind of stay with us. She's, she, you know, she was at that time had the plague already and was feeling pretty rugged. And then the next day we picked up Tracy. So in our little loft place, we were six sleeping six of us in one room. And I don't know how the others felt, but I felt like it was one big happy family. And we all got along and um, we worked like fiends. I mean, it was crazy. We'd be, um, X and I were doing these meetings at 9.30 in the morning. We'd get in the streets after that, you know, after I did my update. There's all this stuff going on. I was interviewing. We were marching. Uh, it was hotter than blazes, and then it would pour down raining. And everybody was out working, and we'd kind of gather up sometime after the last march at night, go back to the loft, and, uh, you know, write or uh, post pictures. And I have to tell you, Jenna Pope, is as sick as she was, she was up and at it every day. And she was dedicated to her, her, her public. Um, she has a huge Facebook presence. Um, if you guys don't know her, you got to check it out. Her uh, Facebook page is I B Jenna I B E J E N A. She's a fantastic photographer. She's a fierce person in the field. She uh, just is right on the scene and in in the thick of it. Um, she's out there every day. She would drag back in, almost unable to make it up the stairs to our loft, and she'd collapse on the sofa she was sleeping on, and she would update her pictures and post them and communicate to her view in public before she'd go to bed. And so this, our average day was we'd start at, um, X and I would, be up and around 8, 8.30. We'd be at these meetings at 9. We'd all run hard until midnight or 1. When we got back to the loft, we'd work on stuff till 2, 2.30, uh, sometimes even 3. I think one morning Jenna was up, you know, because we had a late march, even till 5, posting pictures. Um, Tracy, same thing. She's out there. Um, they have different styles and different eyes, but I just, everywhere you look, there they are, you know, and, and, and Jenna, you know, just in the middle of the scene, Tracy all over the edges. It's like, I was, how is she getting back and forth across the barricades? Because she was like a ninja. And the other astonishing thing is both of these women are, are kind of tiny and they were carrying... 40 pound backpacks 12 14 hours a day everywhere they go because they're carrying all the photo gear right so it's it's a grueling and physically demanding existence and i was you know i try to help out and it'd be late and i'd say okay here i'll carry your back and i'm thinking if i had to carry this thing on my back all day i would be dragging worse than i am now so much respect to those uh, folks, all of them. Um, thank you, Organizer X, for his tireless working. He is an organizer, and we did our best to organize citizen journalists. Um, I don't think we got as much um, accomplished as we would have liked to, but we made some headway, and we, we made it down there in the first day, made some connections with the local newspaper. Um, they came to us um, at one of our meetings, and were interested in helping to cover the events. And we were, you know, a little little dubious because of the whole mainstream media thing. But my, my position is I think anything that gets our, our message out um, truthfully and without spin is valuable and we should take advantage of it. So we met with those guys and uh, the leader of, of one of the reportage crews Seemed to be a real nice guy. He said all the right things. So um, he gave us personal contact information and all. And so we said, all right, you know, cool, we'll we'll contact you. So the first 
march after we met him was a night march. Um, so, of course, we, we go out and um, Nate X and Stop Motion Solo were all out on that. And I think I was on the edge. I might have been mixing that night or something. But I, I wasn't on the march because it was kind of a gnarly rain, rainy night. Um, so I was doing support work and maybe I should, anyway, so I, I contacted the, the people from the observer. They were on the scene within a few minutes with three or four reporters. They went on the whole march in, in, within the protesters. They came back that March ended up around, I probably picked everybody up around midnight by 1 AM they had their story written and posted to their website which is pre-posting for the newspaper um, so we were able to to get it and read it and fact check it and Occupy I did that and uh, it was dead on reportage it was exactly how the rest of the crew saw it unfold you know they were truthful they didn't spin they didn't sensationalize they just said here's the deal this is what was going on if anything it it was complementary to the protests in that they were questioning the um the amount of police um you know present um which was a recurring theme through the whole week um having only been in Asheville and Charlotte I can't speak to this like like some people could but there was easily four or five policemen for every protester without question at all times we were we were accompanied by 600 policemen um, specifically for the protesters the protest group overall was you know on a on a good fat day was about 150 which was a little surprising to me the um, Sunday March on Wall Street had roughly a thousand people um, people came from all over for that a lot of affinity groups but the rest of the week it was you know it was a hundred to 150 hardcore mostly occupiers um, which was really kind of interesting. I expected much larger, and I want to speak to, to some of that uh, going forward. So our experience with the Observer was good. The whole week we stayed in contact with them. The whole week they'd respond anytime without hesitation, two, three, four reporters sometimes. They were uh, creating good content, factual content, posting it, and it made the paper. Um, Occupy I was interviewed and in the uh, in the Charlotte Observer um, you know talking about streaming you know apparently this is a new new thing down in that that part of the world and um, one of the things I wanted to make a point of is that we we all of us out here all of us that do this all of us that watch this we are are sadly overestimating the amount of people who are seeing this stuff? Um, there, we saw a statistic, or Amy Goodman may have pointed it out, about you know connectivity and the use of the internet. And because all of us are using it, our idea is that oh, this is this is accessible to everybody. Where over 70% of the people in the United States do not have access, and or do not use the internet for anything. So it kind of put it in context, and you know, it rolls into our outreach, um, outreach kind of questions that I've been looking at. Um, but that being said, we had had good media relations. We also got to meet and hang out with uh, Dennis Trainer, the director producer of Occupy Autumn. What a fabulous guy he is! No nonsense, hard worker. He was a great inspiration and a great help, and he attended most of our meetings, and we got to be good friends with him. He's also really, really good um, as an activist, independent of um, just his, his film work. He participates in um, 
he participates in GAs. He participates in DA meetings. He participates in marches. You know, he's not one-dimensional. He is very, very thoughtful and very, um, you know, conscious of the need for messaging and the need for engagement and the need for outreach, you know, productive and effective outreach, uh, productive and effective actions. Um, he speaks to that a good bit. He lends any assistance he can. Um, a really good guy. So Dennis Trainer, Occupy Autumn. Um, so that was a, a good connect. We also were able to connect with um, WBT, which is the local TV and radio station there. Um, they actually were carrying Occupy Eyes stream on their website whenever he was live, which was um, pretty pretty big. WBT is the flagship, you know, traditional media station in this part of the country. Actually, they've been around since you know before TV when it was uh, just radio. Um, oddly enough, they're also the uh, like the conservative voice. I mean, their WBT radio is where. Uh, Rush Limbaugh's broadcast daily. So it was interesting that they would, you know, follow us and, and put up Occupy Eyes streams. Um, we, uh, I got to personally meet Amy Goodman in the park one day, and uh, what a delightful person. Can't say enough about democracy now, and she's the real deal. Um, the woman is no nonsense and a great inspiration. Uh, we saw Amy Goodman speak on Sunday night, I think it was, um, to a group of uh, journalists up in the People Center, which was um, the media center that we, we had credentials to. But she gave a, a rousing talk of the importance of media, how dissent is what keeps us safe, and our moral and ethical obligations are to shine the light, speak the truth for power, and refuse to be a megaphone for power. Um, she was insistent, insistent that we must be factual, we must source our material, we have to be on guard against sensationalism, and opinion passed as fact. Um, she, she made it really clear that's what the other side does, that's what all the mainstream media does, that, that they... They, uh, how did she say it, the pundits that know so much about so little and that our only response to that is to be well informed and communicate effectively and communicate truthfully no matter what the story is. And I, I found that very inspiring and I, you know, have um, been chewing that over since you know, we saw her speak. Um, she was out on the street. She goes to where the silence is. She practices what she preaches. Um, it's just fascinating. Um, a little side note is she did, in fact, interview Organizer X uh, during a pause in a march. Um, for those of you who don't uh, realize that Organizer X does work for Public Citizen, Ralph Nader's uh, group. And he is very conversant on policy and uh, a lot of congressional issues. And so um, one of his projects lately has been the uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And he also works on whistleblower issues. So um, he engaged her in a conversation. She was very polite. He was going away. He starts rattling off these house bills on whistleblowing, which is a project he's working on. And she was like, boom, had the microphone there and did the interview um, because she knew source material and news material that was followed up by facts when she heard it. And she didn't hesitate. You know, so, so that was kind of exciting. Organizer X getting interviewed by Amy Goodman. Um, during the week there were a lot of marches. Um, they were, I would not say there was a a predetermined schedule way in advance. Um, there was a whiteboard 
in the encampment. Um, they'd write up what was going on, and uh, you know people would rally rally to it. Um, maybe now's a good time to say a few words about the encampment. Um, my experience there was it was um, my personal experience is it was it was positive and it was upbeat. The um, the police did not harass the uh, the occupiers, uh, and in fact, during some of my interviews, there was some commentary on how polite the police were, um, comparatively speaking, to D.C. and New York. Um, they had a small presence in the park, usually one or two officers. They usually stayed in their cars. There were uh, no problems. Early on the first night, Friday night, I got down on Friday afternoon, there was a GA and a decision was made at the GA that the encampment would be self-maintaining and uh, self, you know, for lack of a better word, self-policing. That uh, we knew a lot of people would be watching, you know, didn't want any drug, alcohol, sexual harassment, any of that stuff because, um, there were enough people there who were concerned about the image that the encampment presented that um, a consensus was reached rapidly in that GA that that's the way it was going to be. The GA was being held at a convergence center. Immediately after the consensus was made, everybody went to the park, gathered all the people that were currently there, you know, at that time, and um, <clears throat> excuse me. And they had a, another GA there and said, "Okay, here's the way it's going to be. We're going to be self-maintaining, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And that was pretty much the the way it was, you know, for for all that that I saw. And I was usually there mornings, um, at least one time in the evenings. You know, not too late. Um, so I didn't stay overnight, but the times that I was there, you know, later at night, it was all pretty positive and mellow thing. Never felt threatened or harassed by the police. Um, things I learned in the encampment. Um, I had an idea or a perception of what I thought the camps would be like. I have to say I was really pleasantly surprised. It was um, much much, um, I wouldn't say organized, but it ran much better than I thought. Um, my experience there was there were a lot of people there working really hard to make these things work. Um, now's a good time. I think uh, everybody knows Lauren DeJoya, the, um, you know, as she introduced herself, the girl with the blue hair from New York, and Jack. They were there, and I will tell you, they are tireless workers, and they were doing everything they could to keep people rallied up, keep the place cleaned up. Um, they led, and I know I use this word carefully, led, uh, but they led by example. There was nobody giving orders. There was nobody in charge. There was just um, just people working. You know, something needed to be done. People would do it. Um, there wasn't a lot of arguing about I mean, there wasn't any arguing about who was going to do it. Um, I actually helped do a supply delivery there. A mountain of stuff. You know, I roll up, my car was packed, and people just popped out there, turned to, unloaded it. They organized it all by the type of material it was, tarped it, made sure, because we were getting a lot of rain, made sure it was, you know, weather protected as as well as possible. It just kind of all happened automatically. The um, the city, oddly enough, brought porta potties and put out on the corner, so there was porta potties. Um, but the Occupy Charlotte people uh, were doing what they could—a very small and committed Occupy group. And one of my favorite things that they did was water stations. You know, they were they were set up some of these communal water stations, and also during the marches. They'd strap a water container to a bicycle and ride it in the marches so people could refill their water bottles. 
So there's all these these little things that kind of reminded me of um, what what really appealed to me about Zuccotti, how these people came together and they literally built something out of nothing. They built it out of out of thin air, and I, I that really appeals to me. And so I saw little bits of that here in the part, and that that made me hopeful. People who had skills that they were contributing for the better of everybody there. Um, you know, there of course wasn't much power or anything, but somebody was smart enough to get some, you know, an extension cord and a couple of power strips and rigged up this power station so people could charge phones and, you know, batteries for laptops and all this stuff. And it wasn't wasn't a big it wasn't a big deal, but it was, you know, that it could happen because you could see, you know, it could scale up. You know, the idea could scale up and the willingness of people to do it. And, you know, my observation was people were very um, helpful to each other and they were looking out for each other's stuff. You know, um, at the power station, which was out in the open because uh, there's just no way to protect it. They had a bad thunderstorm came up and somebody immediately just dashes over, scoops up everything throws it all in a tent, and they sorted it all out later, you know, cell phones, batteries, whatever. But, you know, somebody was really quick on the spot to to do that. And that kind of stuff impresses me. I mean, not that what impresses me matters. Um, so I would say the dynamics of that encampment were pretty good. I did a few reports there. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah. I, well, this is actually one of the rooms the cat stays in. I had to close the door. Um, but the encampment at its peak probably had mm, 75, um, 75, maybe to 100 tents. Um, it's very colorful. It was um, early on, you know, like uh, Saturday and Sunday, there was a lot of, uh, you know, citizens coming through just checking it out. Strollers and kids and dogs and frisbees and it was kind of festive. It was kind of Charlotte's very conservative, so it was kind of a new new thing for them. So I wanted to to get all that out there. And then at the end of the thing, one of our concerns was, okay, what do we do when all the big cameras leave? What's going to happen? Um, you know, are they going to raid it? Are they going to do what? Well, what happened was that uh, Friday morning, all the big cameras were gone. We went down there Friday morning. The uh, that's a federal park that they were in. Marshall Park's a federal park. They came down. They made an announcement and said, "Okay, we're going to close the park and clean it at noon." So eight o'clock. They're saying noon. And uh, so we'd like everybody to have their stuff removed and and all that. And even at, you know the media's there. I mean the big cameras roll up there waiting for the big battle, right? And the big battle didn't happen. Everybody was like, okay, you know, we didn't get hassled all week. Um, we're, you know, it was like this sense of gratitude that they were allowed to, and I used the word allowed, that they stayed in the park without conflict for the week. The request was made now to let's return it to normal. And so the occupiers, you know, they broke camp, they cleaned up. Um, it was, it was no, it was no drama. You know, the drama was how are the occupiers getting back to New York, which is a whole nother story. Um, but pretty good. Some peripheral things that happened in the park. There was a group from New Hampshire that came down and ran kind of like a food, not bombs thing. Uh, made two meals a day for everybody in the park that wanted it. Uh, under the, they weren't food not bombs, but they used the food not bombs model for the most part. Um, and they had a coffee station, which was really well received. Uh, Nadine Hayes, who is a alternative uh, political candidate, was there. Um, Jill Stein came there, and there was apparently, I wasn't there when she came, but apparently there was some un, unfun sort of stuff happened around her. Um, I don't know the details, so I don't want to you know, speak to that. 
Um, I did tweet a bit of a a writing that somebody that was there, you know, pointed out the probably the uh, the negative aspects of that, um, and it's something we certainly need to need to work on. Um, see, and there were some there were some teach-ins. Uh, a fellow came and did uh, Marx in Soho, which was well well received you know by the group just dropped in and did it um you know really you know really generous of him to do that and i interviewed him for a few minutes um so camp life i think was pretty 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 good um and and if um you know if anybody here is different remember this is just my personal observations um so that was camp life. We talked a little bit about the, uh, you know, I guess we could talk a little bit about the police and security because that was um, that was really astonishing. Charlotte was so difficult to get around. The degree of security, um, the amount of officers involved was like nothing I've ever seen. I've been all over the world and I've done some stuff, right? Like I said earlier, there was at least six, five, six police officers for every protesters. The whole center city was enclosed by 10 foot tall, non-scalable, expanded metal uh, barricades. Not, not the little kind of the bicycle barricades like we see so much on live stream and we see these things were 10 foot tall, heavy duty steel with walkways on the back side so the police and everybody could, you know, patrol along there. Um, it was pretty amazing. And I mean, they were everywhere. I don't know how many miles of that stuff they had, but it was crazy. Um, checkpoints were extremely tight. You could not enter without credentials of course the only people who had credentials that could enter were you know delegate and convention related people other than that the guys at the checkpoints pretty much had bad attitudes and weren't very very happy guys i could not get any any of the police or any of the security people to talk to us um except for the one that yelled at me for taking pictures um so i did get yelled at twice by the same Secret Service guy for taking pictures, because you know I'm a threat, right? Um, but for the most part, you know, I tried to talk to some police officers; they wouldn't talk. Oddly enough, on this Sunday march, there were a huge contingent of Charlotte sanitation workers out, um, keeping keeping the city neat and tidy, because you know we didn't want that. And they've been in contract disputes and some labor issues and stuff like that. And we actually went to an organizing uh, rally one morning at their uh, their workplace. But um, I wanted to talk to the sanitation workers, right? So I was very respectful. I go, hi, my name's Mark. I'm a live streamer. This is what I do. This is how it works. And I would love to ask you a couple of questions such as blah, blah, blah. Would you speak on camera? Nobody would speak on camera. And finally, one of the uh, sanitation workers told me that their supervisors told them that they were not allowed to speak to any media, which, you know, kind of sums it up, right? Not allowed to speak to any media. They were silenced. You know, Amy Goodman's talk was about people being silenced, like the silenced majority. These people were part of the silenced majority. Um, I found that really interesting and they do not have union protection and what the meeting we went to is like was to begin discussions on organizing that so you know their their jobs rely on accommodating the instructions of their supervisors whether they're right wrong or indifferent um, oddly enough and I made what I think was a pretty strong effort to talk um, to people on the street, people who were not participating in the marches, but bystanders. 
a stunning, stunning thing to me was the unwillingness of people to speak up and speak out. Nobody wanted to talk. Nobody wanted to have a conversation on camera or off. I found that interesting. Um, we were harassed by, you know, some young Republicans and, you know, the, you know, typical fraternity sorority groups that kind of hang around for Bloody Marys on Sunday afternoons. Um, not that I don't like Bloody Marys, because I do. But, you know, they kind of, you know, snarled at us, snarled at me. Um, you know, could tell they, they weren't too pleased about their routines being interrupted. But um, people, people are hesitant to speak up. And I, I wonder if it's because they don't want to be responsible for what they say. Or the other thing is they truly have nothing to say. Because in all honesty, I did meet somebody who spoke. And she was very open and honest about it. She said, I don't really know anything about the issues. Um, they don't really, I don't feel like they affect me. I'm really uninformed and I just don't worry about it too much. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you know, I was like, wow, crazy, right? But the, the apathy of the population in general, or the fear, but it felt more like apathy was amazing. I look back historically uh, these conventions would bring out protesting groups into thousands you know 8, 10, 12, 20,000 RNC in Philadelphia uh, WTO in the late 90s even Denver Minneapolis had a bunch of protesters uh, a lot of people rising up and speaking out that was non-existent here in Charlotte and from what I understand for the most part non-existent at the RNC so the question I have is like what what has happened you know why do are, do, are people afraid are people just feeling defeated are we that apathetic are we that distracted I see this as a real problem and yes this is an editorial part um, the lack of willingness of people to engage is what enables the powers to be to keep doing what they do. Um, I've done an enormous amount of reading in the last uh, week about these sorts of things. Um, I think it's important that um, I think numbers are important. Masses of people. Every every successful social change has come on strength of numbers, not not violence, um, but just strengths of numbers. Uh, Czechoslovakia, you know, the Velvet Revolution, um, civil rights marches, and and we get in these conversations, and um, we we go, well, things are different. Well, yeah, things are different, but if you look through two thousand years of history the things that work are quite similar. And so I think it's incumbent on us to think about how can we bring people into the conversation? How can we bring people into the movement? Not just the Occupy movement, but the movement for social change. There are a lot of people who agree on the same things. Where are they? You know, we talk about this. Where are they? You can put 70,000 people in a football stadium in 16 cities across the United States every Sunday to watch a football game. Where are the 70,000 people who are willing to rise up and speak out and demand social justice and actually work to change that? Um, this is like the leading question in my mind, you know, where um, I looked back at some video from Zuccotti from September, October. There was, you know, on a weekend, thousands of people there, families, you know, a lot happening, energy, positive, positive, positive. 
then after the eviction, you know, it doesn't happen. There used to be thousands of people in the chats. Thousands. I personally modded Global Revolution on a day where I modded for 14 hours, and there was over 10,000 people on that chat at any given time during those 14 hours. Where are all those people? We got to ask, where are they? Why were they engaged? And where did they go? And why did they go there? What what has happened? What has changed? I think this is a question we need to to explore. Um, a couple of more just opinions and editorial comments. Uh, what I observed was that there was a lot of hardworking, committed people um, on the ground with great intentions and great passion. They're they're tired. You know, we've been rolling rocks uphill uh, for a long time. I've been doing this since, you know, the end of September. And, you know, I think I can speak to it. It is grueling. And to see just, you know, not even, uh, I would say, incremental change, but not a lot of forward motion, not a lot of unity. We're not getting the numbers. Very little substantive uh, substantive progress and people debate this with me all the time and, and I'm I'm open to that conversation but I I think we have the capability of huge change and I think somehow we lost momentum and to deny that is a tactical mistake it's a strategic mistake, and and to to be delusional about our situation is not going to serve us well. And I don't think there's a problem with putting all this out on the table and having a conversation, looking for the questions, looking for the answers, and doing something about it. Um, to to point out a problem is not a divisive tactic. To point out a problem with the intent of helping provide a solution is is incredibly helpful. We need, uh, I made a list of where I saw the weaknesses were. And this is, this is from conversations with a lot of people that have been involved at a lot deeper level than me, you know, some people that I got to meet. But our issues are st strategy, tactics, information management, outreach and education um, we we have a lot of passion we have a lot of people the depth of their knowledge is sometimes suspect not the depth of their intent but the depth of their knowledge you know we're not we're not we're not reading enough we're not having substantive conversations enough we do not make good tactical decisions we do not um, we do not effectively advance our cause and we are not effectively practicing outreach. Um, so I think these are the challenges. And I was talking to the team earlier today. I said, I don't feel like we can do anything about strategy or tactics, you know, because we're, we're not on the ground. Um, clearly immediately pointed out, well, we can do something about that. And she was right. Uh, my thing is what we can do is we can we can inform and educate and practice outreach with each other. But we got to get beyond the bubble. There in my little community, in my little community, Cat's Woman is not watching yet, but she lives on the north end of our county. We live in a very conservative, a very rural area. Um, nobody knows about Occupy. Nobody knows about movements towards social change. We live in a county that has well over 10% unemployment. The annual income in this county is somewhere around, you know, the per capita income, um, somewhere around $20,000. It's um, very a very depressed county. These people, my neighbors, all of us, have a vested interest in turning this stuff around. 
but there is zero knowledge. Nobody, I mean, I went out in town, you know, it's a little town. I walk up and down the street. I talk to people I know. Hey, do you know what TARP, you know, the TPP is? No, never heard of it. Well, you know the six jobs that are left in the county? If you pass TPP, they're gone. Um, it's like NAFTA on steroids. NAFTA is what broke the furniture industry in this part of the in this part of the state. Um, for example, um, you you asked, do you know what NDAA is? Never heard of it. Don't know. Um, well, you know, it's like you explain NDAA to highlights. Well, how's that possible? You know, people are not are not conversant in these things. So I'm like, okay, what can we do? What can I, as a person, do that certainly doesn't know? Um, hardly anything in detail compared to so many other people but what can I do well I can do a show I can do a presentation so in a couple of weeks I'm going to do a show here in our little town we're renting a meeting hall we're going to call it um, to be alive is to be political or something like that and I'm I'm begging everybody in the community to come just so we could have these conversations and when I show people these things and and I discuss them, I say, hey, this is what I saw. I, I saw immigration naturalization service people harassing the no paper, no fears people and recording them on film so they could go back and get them later. You know, and people say, that's, that's, well, that's just, is, is it right? You know, and just on and on and on. And so I think all of us need to start having these conversations and we need to have it with people besides ourselves. We need to have it well beyond our bubble. We need to have dinner discussions. We need to talk to people we don't know and we need to be fearless about it. We need to be able to be embarrassed and to, and to get out of our comfort zone. Um, at DNC, I was handing out printed First Amendment cards, right? I had all these printed First Amendment cards. You know, people don't know what the First Amendment says. Um, so just trying to stir some people up. Um, I think it's just a matter of waking them up and competing with the distractions. So... Um, this stuff obviously has been on my mind a lot. Um, I think that we have we have a movement full of artists and eloquent speakers and passionate people, and we got we've got to get out there and and do it. Um, I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'm going to say something that's going to be wildly unpopular. And even people on my own team agree with this. But I have to say, in my personal experience, the, the marches were not terribly effective. Um, in fact, the, the marches distracted from outreach efforts that could have been productive. Um, the information being conveyed was productive, but the marches were distracting because we have to know how to speak to those we want to reach better. Um, I think a rally is a good thing. I think a march should begin with a rally. Um, I've been saying this week that I feel like the marches are kind of like pep rallies. Um, maybe if they had specific goals and specific purposes that were communicated effectively in advance, that they would be more powerful. Um, I think, for instance, looking at the teachers in Chicago, that that their marches are effective. Um, but if you notice, before they march, they always have a rally. They always have some educational element, um, which that is not a pun because they're teachers. I mean, they're conveying information to each other and the public at large, and they're gathering larger support. They're focused, and they have a mission. And yes, if they realize their goal, they may disband. But the point is, they're realizing their goal. And I don't think it's so much 
to do with the fact that they're a union is they're a group of people that have a common interest in a common place they all want to be that they can transcend everything and move in that same direction and it's a powerful force um, and you'll notice that that you know they're getting more and more community support and I I have to guess that it's a very complicated situation there because so many people are peripherally affected because all these kids that go to school now they can't go to school right that means all the parents that are used to the kids being in school now they have to juggle jobs and stuff to, to, to take care of the kids it's a far-reaching thing and by definition it's inclusive but it could go either way you know the teachers could do something that would alienate the peripheral support groups or they can do something and have done stuff that includes them that this is not just our issue our fight this is this is ours and yours we're we're in this together and I think personally that is a good example and this is the kind of stuff that we in the Occupy movement and we in all social justice movements should be looking at. You cannot deny the advantage of a thousand or a million voices speaking to the same issue and to do so or to discount that is just you know not very effective and doesn't have a lot of common sense so um, that's kind of where where I am on the editorial stuff and um, so so what else DNC anyway to summarize DNC it was a great experience I'm really glad that I went I learned a lot I met awesome people I'm inspired by them I'm hopeful I will say for the first time in my life I felt simultaneous overwhelming despair because these problems are so huge they're so complex all the power lays with these institutions and organizations it is truly a David and Goliath struggle but I felt hopeful in spite of it and in response to it because I met people like Amy Goodman. I work with people who are down there with me, you know, Organizer X, Occupy I, Jenna, Tracy, Stop Motion Solo. Um, I'm, I met, I saw Lauren DeJoya and Jack, you know, meeting the authorities head on in an intelligent, articulate, demanding way. I saw just these people who spoke with us. Um, the fellow from D.C. who just was, you know, a, a, a large, proud, strong, emphatic black man that gave the most moving speech. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Sanchez people, and then I'll take a call. So um, I wanted to get get by by that. But all these great people... I'm like, hell, if they can tilt at windmills, so can I, till the day I die. And so I'm in. Um, I found it very, very optimistic in the face of certain doom, I guess. Um, Sanchez family, and then I'll take some calls. So um, we heard about these people who were involved in some foreclosure stuff. Bank of America, you could see it from their front porch. You know, the towering, towering Bank of America. So Stop Motion Solo and I went over there, and um, we wanted to, to interview interview them, you know, to get their story. Just the kindest, sweetest people, Latino family, Mr. Sanchez, uh, Gonzalez, and uh, Sylvia was the mom, and uh, Jessica was one of the daughters. And so we went, and they were sort of having kind of a awareness rally at their house, and there was a local advocacy group that had provided some food. So they were cooking and, you know, making all the all the food and everything. It, it was god awful weather. It's like raining like the end of days, and this is in a working class neighborhood in North Charlotte. And the way we found it, because you know we had Ocu directions, which were kind of like got you within the general geography of the place but the specifics were all fouled up 
So we drove around and I saw this, this barbecue grill um, in the pouring down rain, the only barbecue grill going in the whole neighborhood. I said, okay, that, that totally has to be it, right? So we, we pull in and, uh, oh, it's totally like Aki time, the whole thing, DJ, you have no idea. <laughs> but um, so we go in and we meet the people and we start interviewing them. And they were so kind and sweet and generous and just the same story. They're, they're not the only people in that neighborhood. There's two dozen houses in this neighborhood with the same deal. All Bank of America, all these people have lost their jobs because they're working class, lower working class, you know, construction workers, service industry people. The economy crashed. They lost their jobs. They can't make the house payment. Um, so the, y you know, it's this story, right? And Mr. Gonzalez, he's he's there cooking for people, and he's telling me his story. And Mrs. Gonzalez is into, I mean, Mrs. Sanchez is in the kitchen, and you know, she's getting food. And you know, they're they're strong people, but you could tell they were carrying this burden. Um, so the deal was, you know, Bank of America gives them a um, gives them a notice a month ago, and says, okay, your back payment is twenty thousand dollars. You got to come up with it by the fourteenth, and we're going to foreclose on you. So these poor people had a month to scare up twenty thousand dollars. Well, if they had twenty thousand dollars, they wouldn't be behind, right? So what did they do immediately? They started selling dinners off their front porch. They were doing car washes. They were trying to clean the houses. They were doing everything they can. And they, they, you know, they made 700 bucks, you know, working themselves to death to try to, to meet this obligation. So they had this rally, and we talked about that a little bit. Um, the other part of the story is their daughter Jessica has spina, bi spina bifida, spina bifida and hyperencephalitis and a kidney problem. Um, they are uninsured, of course. So now they're losing their shelter, their home that they've been in for 12 years. Their daughter has catastrophic health expenses, which, you know, Mrs. Sanchez goes, okay, do we, do we take care of our daughter? Or do we take care of our house? She has, I mean, you know, there's a the choice, right? So huge, huge problems. Um, huge problems. Uh, and I didn't catch that, Georgia, but I'll go back up in a moment and get it. Um, so, you know, it was really touching and heart-wrenching. So we leave and, uh, you know, we go and there's a march and all that that night. So the march ends up about nine o'clock at night. And <laughs> hand over. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, peaceful. Um, hand you over to Nike Will. Okay. Um, so we end the march, and as the march is ending, we're rallying back in the in the in the park. Here comes one of the neighbors that I had met from the Sanchez event bearing in their arms all this food, flank steak, chicken, salad, uh, friolis, tortillas, just everything. And I was like, what's this? They brought it out. They brought it out so the, um, the marchers could eat, the protesters could eat, the campers could eat. And I talked to the neighbor. I said, so I, this is unbelievable what's the story and because I I've just talked to this family who doesn't have you know money for anything they had groceries you know for a week or so they could have could have been fine as far as groceries they gave it all away they cooked it all after we left they continued cooking they gave it all away brought it to the park because Mrs. Sanchez said those people need to eat. We have food. We should. We cannot end our days by knowing that we have something that we could share and we don't. So here's people with essentially nothing that are giving away what they have. They had the spirit of generosity to do that, even in the face of all their problems. 
So I think that was an incredible object lesson. Um, every time I think about it, I tear up because I know how desperate their situation was. And I know what an act of generosity that was for them to give food to people who didn't have it. So um, that's the story on the Sanchez family, which I think, you know, made me feel, you know, like I can do more. So, all right, that's the DNC blah, blah, blah editorial. You know, I know I ran on a long time, but see, we got a little more time. So if anybody wants to participate, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to change a couple little things right here and um, we're preparing this and we're preparing that and if I have all my settings right you can call that number ladies and gentlemen and I will answer the phone and you can ask me a question or you can make a comment and everybody will hear it so um, I hope you'll uh, have something to add to the conversation a question a comment we want to hear what you have to say um, that is a Google number so don't be freaked out when it says leave your name or something um, but somebody has to call so we can see if it works so that's 828-705-1676 also known as 1OPN if you can believe that man I got a college show. It only works when somebody calls. If if it's a call-in show and nobody calls, then it's just a show. You know, come on, just for the novelty. Zena, you got to call at least. Somebody has to call so we can see if it works. Nobody's going to call? Call. Beg <laughs> Zena, call. Do somebody call. Surely there's a question. Surely there's a comment. Oh, there we go. Call from... Caller. Dave. To accept, press 1. To send a voice to... Dave. How are you, Dave? Hey. Could you hear me? Can you hear me, Dave? Hey. Yeah, I sure can. Yeah, great. So, uh, what do you you have a question or you want to make a comment? Well, uh, maybe just a, a quick comment that um, looking forward to the one year anniversary of Occupy, and we're going to be doing a lot of stuff in my home city, Sacramento, California. Uh, Okay. And, uh, uh, I want to say hi to everybody here on the screen. Um, and, uh, uh, I want to say hi to everybody here on the screen. <laughs> uh, you guys all, you guys all know me by my screen name, D Jack Rocks. So now there's a voice to go with the screen name. Outstanding. If you could turn your speakers down a little bit, Dave, that would be helpful. Okay, there we go. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, that's good. You're getting feedback, so that's great. So, um, so you're in Sacramento, and have you been uh, watching OPN very often, or is this a new night for you? Um, I have uh, on occasion tuned in. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on this other site, Global Revolution, uh, but I've, I've tuned in to you guys uh, a few times. It seems like there's not always something going on on this channel. Sometimes I, I go to this go to the channel and it's blank and there's nobody here, but uh, I guess I caught you when there's something going on tonight. Yeah, well, I appreciate you. Um, appreciate you tuning in. We we are not a twenty four seven channel. We do several shows a week, and you know we try to try to do live all the time. So, thank you for your patience uh -huh. and for for tuning in. It's wonderful. I want to just give you a shout out because you are the first live caller to call in on live stream. So everybody's all excited about that. 
So thank you so wow, much. Wow! Hey, <laughs> that is exciting. All right, so All I'm gonna right. I'm gonna um, gonna let somebody else try to get on. Thank you for your call. Okay. All right. Occupy. We're the ninety nine. Thank you, Dave. Have a good evening. All right. Okay, so um, everybody that's calling, I can see it popped up. <laughs> Ruby left. One. Call back now. I can only take one call at a time. You know, we're we're babes in the woods here. So I totally want to hear Ruby call. So Ruby, give us give us another call here. Um, I think once you once you guys hear me connect with somebody, wait till we hang up before we get the next call, and then it doesn't pile up. So. Uh, as they say in the radio business, lines are open, 828-705-1-OPN. That's 828-705-1676. Hey, well, no switchboard. <laughs> you should see, you should see my, my desk. Good Plus, I'm like doing this all. At, okay, here we go. We have another call. Awesome. Ruby. To accept, press 1. To send a voice. Hello, Ruby. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, Ruby, you're on the air. Welcome to OPN, the call-in show. Hi, Art. <laughs> Hi, Art. Hi. It's good to good to have a, a, a voice with the name. So what would you like to say to us tonight? Do you have a question or you just want to make a comment? Or are you uh, going to tell me I've been talking too much and rambling too much? <laughs> No, I just wanted to call and say everybody at OPN does a great job, and we really appreciate it. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, and thank you for calling. And Zena says hugs and kisses from her. So uh, you have quite a fan club out there. Thank you for calling and for being such a okay. good supporter. Good night. Peace and groovy love. Bye. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Tarp. You know, I just mashed the off button. Um, so that was great. We heard from Ruby. Um, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions anybody has, um, or if you want to make a comment. But um, how's the quality and uh, all that working? Is it, um, you know, does it sound good on your end? Does it look good? You missed Ruby server crash. Honk, honk. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. I'm really glad. So do you think... Oh, here we have another call. Call from John Ned. To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press 2. Hello, Johnny. Hello. Hey, Johnny, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. What have you got to say? What do you got to say to the OPN crew and the channel tonight? Does you work? Yeah. yeah uh, well, I was just going to say, uh, good job. I'm, I'm kind of writing you a letter as it goes going on. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm planning on, you know, this weekend. I'm, I'm going back up. It's been a long time, probably since April or something since I was up that way. And uh, I'm going back to Zuccotti this weekend. So it gives me goosebumps just to get back up there, you know. But uh, it's... Yeah, uh, you, you asked the question about where's people go and what happened to all the 10,000 people and 20,000 people. It was, you know, I mean, we're still out there. We're just lies swallow us up and people burn out. You know, it's hard. You know yourself? Yeah. It's hard not to burn out. Oh, yeah. Uh -oh. So how are you online and answering me at the same time? It's magica. It's magica. I have skills. And how did you know this is me? Well, because I am all seeing and all knowing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> But, did I give you this number before? No, yeah, you did. Yeah. So it actually okay. anybody okay. who's in my phone book pops up with a name. So um Okay, good. I mean this phone's in my buddy's name, so it's like how the hell is he? Yeah. <laughs> but hey, it's, it's good to talk to you, boss. How yeah. you doing? Well it's great. I appreciate you calling and I appreciate all your support and you know, the awesome letters you send and you know, it's good to hear your voice. So I hope you have a good time up in Zuccotti, you know, I'm glad you're getting back up there. Yeah, I mean, soon I'm moving out to Wyoming with my uh, you know, girlfriend, family kind of thing going on out there. But, uh, you know, no matter where you go, there you are. So you can occupy wherever you're at. And uh, 
uh, I suppose that, you know, maybe I have to take more chances on, uh, you know, instead of preaching to the choir or sending out to, uh, you know, you have to start talking. You can go out there and do a show at a rodeo. We'll cover it live. I'll, I'll get you set up to stream for us. That's what I'm talking about, the outreach, man. That's what's got to happen. So, well, I've, I've been listening a lot to what you're saying about that, and those uh, kind of, that, you know, I'm feeling guilty. You know, sometimes we've had these talks and letters about, uh, you know, these other guys like that, we got to start loving guy. I was like, I feel so uncommitted compared to him, you know? And it's, right. You know, you can't be daunted by that. You still have to do what you can, when you can. You know, you, know, you say... Do what you, you know, do what you can with with what you have, you know, and then you make the best of it. And, you know, I'm I'm keeping it alive in myself, and then you know, and then I got forty or fifty people that I mail out to, you know, every couple of weeks. Like you know, uh, I'm trying to, yeah. It, but we are morphing. I'm not sure into what and 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 what we have to call out or or reinforce in. But I know that when you're saying we have to do more effective reach out, is that is part of it, and, and to, to reconnect with the people who were interested to begin with. And, you know, life happens, and, and you know, bills still have to get paid, and people are losing jobs and losing unemployment, and, you know, but the, uh, you know, the palpable electricity that used to be there in Ducati when I used to hang there was uh, so invigorating. I mean, well, you know when you're in the, you must have the same feeling when you're the, the DNC crowd and just the, you know, the, the purity of the integrity of the Absol hearts of these people that they're absolutely you know, that's a good way of, of putting it it's, like it's so selfless even though there are egos involved but overall it is just for the movement you know right. and it's something that needs to happen and well I think I'm probably I hear myself I'm, I'm not in the room but I can hear my voice going here so I'm I'm probably taking up too much time, but uh, this is Johnny Greed, the lurker. I'm the good kind of greed, not the bad kind of greed. That's why I'm against Wall Street, because they're giving greed a bad name, and I have to go clean up my nickname that I've had since 17, so fuck them bastards. <laughs> oh, am I allowed to curse on the radio? Of course. You know, we're a free speech zone, buddy. So <laughs> thank you for calling, and thank you for your support. Hey, I love you, and uh, all you guys. This is uh, I never never do the chat thing. So, but all you guys out there, I read you all the time, and uh, keep it up and great work. And uh, you know, uh, hey, if anybody wants to get my emailing, offer offer it out, uh, and then I'll include include stuff there. But uh, love all you guys, and occupy forever. Let's go. All right, take care. And, uh, it's good to talk to you finally, Mark, in person. Yeah, it's awesome. Thanks for calling. Hey, no problem, bud. Have a good night. All right, you too. So long. Love all you guys out there in Chatland. Keep it real. Bye-bye. So there was a uh, a longtime uh, lurker and supporter. Um, really excited that, that he called in. Um, we got any other calls? Any questions? Any comments? You know, I want to get people speaking up and speaking out, you know, um, this is this is important, and um, I'm interested in hearing um, if you think this is a good idea and a good platform. Um, if it seems to go over well, we're talking about expanding it and doing topical discussions. Um, a good point, Prophecy. I have another call. Call from... Northern. To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press 2. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening, nurse. nurse. Hey. This is your first international call. Oh, my first international call. Won't you Won't you tell us who you are? So, um, I just was... Northern guy with uh, OWNN. OWNN, one of our great supporters. Thank you so much. It's good to hear your voice, buddy. Uh, calling from Canada. Now... Uh, number one, just to let you know, you guys are doing a damn good job there, and uh, it's very, I'm very, very happy to see a new, a new uh, call-in program, so to speak. So again, uh, Occupy is keeping on top of technology. That's the main thing after a year. They can't bury us technology-wise. We're way ahead of them. That's number one. Number two, you were uh, you were saying we got to do better outreach, and I posted some things in your uh, chat. 
Right. And and one of them is is you uh, you you have to look at your own history. Your own history speaks time and time again of what has to be done. Look at all the major movements. They sent people from the large centers to the small centers. Number one, to educate. Number two, to inform. Number three, to outreach. This worked over and over and over again. And who still does it today? The unions, the Salvation Army, religions do it. Copy them. And the sooner that that's done, the better. Another example is the uh, Irish... And the Brits. I don't know if the Brits actually got to it. But the Irish had it on the table where they were going to send out vans to the smallest villages with full workshops, okay, Mm -hmm. where they could hold classes, where they could educate, where they could uh, uh, talk to the whole community. And they would stay there for one day or two days. And that's going to the smallest villages. Again... There's no reason, if we, if you just look at your own history, that the same things cannot be done today. I, it's I, not. It's not that the. It's not that the uh, the answers aren't there. They're staring us in the face. Exactly. And that's and all I got to say. I think that was a great great point because one of the things that I am always talking about is history and context. History and context. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. This is not That's right. this is not a new thing. This is no. this has been happening for 3000 years. And the solutions are there for all of us. All we have to do is read our history, learn from them and act. So thank you for bringing then, that out. And then another thing too is this gang mentality of sending 15 streamers to one location. This happened in uh, NATO. It happened at the uh, RNC and the DNC. And all of them never needed 15 streamers. Yes, it was good for all the streamers to get together. Yes, it was good to uh, network when they were together. But what got missed was all the Labor Day activities in all the major cities. Right, right. Well, where, uh, where there could have been a lot of outreach done. Exactly, and I've been having that same conversation uh, around September 17th because you know that's like the center of the Occupy Universe right now, so everybody's going there. If I could travel, I would be going to Chicago because that's where the story is right now. The, the true story is in Chicago. Um, uh, the, true, the true story is in Ontario where they took away the right... Uh, two days ago, of 191,000 uh, teachers to strike for two years. They took away their collective bargaining. Oh, really? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. So the next the, the make, next big political battle is going to be in Ontario. The teachers have declared war on the Ontario government. So in any case, I'm holding you up uh, way too long. I could go on forever. Uh, I'm just calling to say congratulations. Uh, this is a good technology. Have a wonderful time with it. You're doing a good job. You've got a wonderful crew. They're on top of it. They were on top of everything when you were at Tampa. Your staff were on top of everything when you were at Charlotte. So you you are well, your back is covered there. So congratulations. Well, thank you so much for your call, and keep doing your thing because we have mad respect for you, sir. And thank you for being okay. so supportive. Okay, thank you. Our first ever international call. Holy cow. It's an exciting day, and what great words from Northern. I'm really happy he called in. He's been a really uh, supportive guy and really encouraging of our... (laughs) DJ, I want to call. So we were trying to get it so we could run it through Google uh, Voice, but, you know, it would just bog everything down. So that's why we were on the the phone, Um, because we would love to hear you. Does anybody else want to call, or do we want to wrap this up? It's been an hour and a half, and I suspect people have other things to do. Um, I'm pretty excited about this. you know, I think it works, and uh, I'd be love to hear any feedback from anybody 
about what we can do with this, you know, ideas of how to use it more effectively. Artister at o-p-n.org. You can email me there or get on our website and email any of the other people on the production team. And, um, you know, let us know how we can. We got another call coming in. Hold on, please. Call from Tor. Whoa, we had a call, and then, and then she hung up, and she knows who she is. Why did she hang up? Amigo's going to try to call. <laughs> no, go, go, Amigo. It's open. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Can you guys... So is it, is it Brenda Mouse. It said you weren't available. Well, you know, I'm available. You know, I'm sitting right here. Oh, I know what the problem is. Hold on for a second. I bet, I bet I have to do... Okay, try it again if somebody wants to call. You probably clanged in. Huh. All right, we're waiting for a call. Maybe my phone got overloaded. Amy Goodman, he's available. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, everybody's gun shy now. Nobody wants to call. So, I think we'll snort. Somebody's snorting. All right, I'm going to go ahead and probably wrap this up if nobody else is wanting to call. Amigo, I'm waiting for you. Calling, okay. Everybody hold our breath. It's not, it's not ringing on my end yet. Ringing, ringing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Amigo, what are you getting? Anything? <laughs> Don't hold your breath, DJ. You know, it's it's running through a lot of hops. It could be, you know, that being a Google not available honk. Not true. I wonder if we're limited to amounts of calls. Google is not supposed to. So and his server just crashed again. No, hey Zena, try try calling me and see if you get that message again. I just just for testing. So this is this is live, people. This is the way it works. The way it works is that it doesn't always work. Um, you know, I really want Amigo on because you know, for those of you guys who have never talked to Amigo, he's awesome. So Zena, call, call, call. Come on, do it. Let's see if it works. You don't even have to talk long. I'm getting all kinds of uh, messages from four missed calls. This all the missed calls. Come on. Senator, are you going to call or no? The phone is a big, then little big effing quilt. What the heck does that mean? All right. So, somehow... We need to figure out how to do multiple calls and holding. Not available. Okay. All right. So we're gonna chalk it up to a Google, a Google mess it up, and um, we'll wrap it up for tonight. Could be I need to reboot my phone. All right. So I'm gonna thank you guys for calling and for being here on uh, on this momentous occasion on OPN. And thank you so much for everybody that called in. Thank you so much for everybody that watched. Uh, we'll do this again soon. And uh, we'll give everybody a heads up. <laughs> hey, DJ, do I, does that make up for my slackness? The, you know, like last week? Um, we're really glad to have all you guys here. So spread the word. We will do this more. We'll dial into tech a little bit. And, um, you know... It's been a great night on OPN. Thank you for listening to me ramble. Remember, outreach, inform, education, strategy, tactics, um, 
I need the NyQuil. I'm going to go get some in just a moment, Peaceful. Thank you for being here tonight. But seriously, we need to get the numbers up. We need to build bridges. We need to make connections. We are not going to do it if we don't admit where our weaknesses are. We have to confront them. We have to work on them. And we can do it together and we can change the world. I love you all. Thank you for watching. And um, I wonder if this archived. It would be awesome, right? Okay. Talk to you soon. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching.